I'd like to uh, present our, our guests in this panel, um, the panel Impact and Governance of Defense Acquisition Programs. Uh, Mr. Uf Anderson, he is, um, well, uh, before, before uh, sorry, uh, before presenting our guests, I'd like to, to, to thank BA uh, uh, system because uh, BA generally agreed to sponsor the, uh, our conference, the uh, Premier and Abed. Uh, um, so I'd like to renew the thanks uh, uh, we made at the opening remarks of our conference. Um, it's a very generous and important uh, uh, supporting that we are receiving for, from the AE system. I also like to point out that this round table, this panel here is an effort to bridge the gap between scholars and practitioners between university and uh, uh, companies in the fields of defense. It's important to make this, this movement. Um, and also I'd like to mention that uh, in this conference, we have uh, other round tables and panels on defense economy, uh, uh, science and technology, uh, defense industry, where we can further the discussions we are uh, having here. And you also can keep in pace with ongoing research conducted by Brazilian scholars. So uh, um, I don't like, want to take uh, too much time. So I'm going to present our, uh, our guests. We have Mr. Uh, uh, Uf Anderson. He used to be marketing manager with uh, uh, commercial uh, marine sector to Asian and East European markets. And since 2003, he works for BAE System. In, and uh, uh, in the last 10 years, uh, uh, Mr. Anderson has been working with offset industrial cooperation in, uh, in many programs as industrial cooperation manager uh, within BAE System. We also, uh, uh, and uh, Mr. Anderson, we thank you very much to uh, uh, join us in our conference. We also have uh, uh, Mr. Marco Café. Uh, he is the BAE System General Manager for Brazil. Uh, uh, Mr. Café is a retired colonel from the Brazilian Army. And uh, I, I just noticed that he is from the, the, the first group that uh, 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 the first group that uh, uh, received the, the, the first organic uh, uh, aviation systems from uh, in the Brazilian Army, the, the helicopters. That's very important to me because uh, a few, few weeks ago, I just finished uh, a paper about the impacts of the Malvinas war in Brazilian military forces. And one of the impacts was the, the, the fact that the creation of the organic uh, uh, aviation in the, uh, within the Brazilian army. So it's a, a, a very uh, interesting coincidence. Um, Mr. Café holds a master in military administration from uh, Brazilian Army Command Staff College and also attended uh, uh, the French uh, uh, Ecole de Guerre. Uh, we also are very happy to have with us um, Mr. Peterson Silva, Professor Peterson Silva. Professor Silva is professor at the Escola Superior de Guerra, uh, Brasilia campus. Uh, and I believe that uh, uh, soon it will be uh, Escola Superior de Defesa. Uh, Professor Silva also holds a PhD in international relations from the University uh, from Universidade de São Paulo, and we also have our uh, uh, colleague uh, Professor Tamiri Santos, who holds a PhD in, in strategic studies from the uh, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, the university where I work. And she is a fellow postdoc researcher with, with, uh, within the strategic studies uh, postgraduate program at Federal, Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul. So uh, after the presentations, 
uh, I would like to inform you all that we will uh, follow the, the program. So uh, first, Mr. Wolf Anderson will make a presentation of 15 minutes, about 15 minutes. Uh, Marco Café uh, then will follow him, then Tamiris, and finally, uh, Peterson uh, Silva. Um, after the, the four presentations, we will open uh, the floor for question and answer. So thank you all for coming. And uh, please, Mr. Anderson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Boa uh, tarde, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure for me being invited to this event. Uh, my name is Ulf Andersson, representing BAE Systems Sweden in, uh, in the BAE Systems family. Uh, I work as the industrial cooperation manager and I will talk a bit about how we work in this field. Uh, before we enter into the beautiful world of industrial cooperation, just a quickie how, how, how we fit in BAE System Hegnons into the larger BAE Systems organization. If you look to the circle on the right side, you will find us being part of the American sector platforms and services, uh, along with some other business units as well. Another Swedish company, Boforce. We have the weapon systems in US, UK, the combat vehicles from US and the ship repair in US as well. Ultimately to the left, we have the UK entity, the, the BAE systems PLC. Uh, next please. And um, what do we do? Uh, Heglunds, we design, we develop, we manufacture, integrate and support military vehicles. The primary products are the CV-90 family, the me which is a medium weight combat vehicle. We have the articulated and armored all-terrain vehicles called BV, BVS. Uh, all these vehicles typically have a lifetime of some 25, 30 years. And during its lifetime, we provide as well substantial logistical support and uh, services. Next, please. Uh, BA System Haglunds, we have more than 60 years of experience, production and development of tracked vehicles. I will certainly not go into each and every one of them. Uh, 15 minutes wouldn't be enough. But if you recall the, the, the products I highlighted on previous page, we can see the CV90 in the middle where the development started in the late 80s. Uh, with a continuous development, we, we, we have further developed into new generations through the years and decades into the modern version of today. Same goes with the all-terrain vehicles, the BV, started already in the 70s in plastic versions, became ar armored in the 80s, and uh, continued growth and development in the remaining, in the next years as well. Uh, next, please. Industrial cooperation and partners. Uh, that is the topic for today. So let's see how we work in this field. Next, please. Uh, with or without formal obligations or commitments, uh, Heglunds have conducted the industrial cooperation for several decades. We do have a track record, which we are pretty proud of. Uh, we have delivered always on time or ahead of schedule, uh, always to the values committed or exceeding the values committed. Up till today, we have a successful performance in 11 countries, and we hope to increase that number of flags in future. Uh, it's fair to say that for us, industrial cooperation is part of our daily work. Uh, next, please. Oh, 
uh, the same uh, information more in figure facts. Uh, industrial cooperation commitments accomplished within stipulated time frames, 100%. Whereas 90% of that was actually uh, ahead of uh, the, the requested time frames. It means zero delays and zero legal issues whatsoever. Uh, next, please. So what are the cooperation areas that we invite to and why do we do that? Uh, the second question is pretty easy to, to simple to, to answer. It's the fact that we need the competence and the resources from external partners to pull through a demanding vehicle production program such as these. Uh, it's a necessity and it makes us better and our products better. Uh, to continuously develop the products, we need, of course, to keep an eye on new technologies, what's on its way to the market, what is new on the market. And in this area, pretty interesting cooperation opportunities can occur. When we recognize that there is a specific business opportunity somewhere, we need, of course, to assess that customer's requirements uh, and see how it fits into our products. Do we have a off-the-shelf uh, solution available already, or will there be need for some further development work? Quite often, the latter is, is the conclusion. And also in this area, we, we, we find opportunities for, for cooperation. Depending on the, the partners we, we select and we choose, there will be a mix of technology cooperation and technology transfer. Then again, we have the, the, the vehicle production itself, of course as a logical cooperation area. And the vehicle consists of a num number of, of uh, quite sophisticated subsystems. Also for these subsystems, you, you, we, we reach out to seek partnerships. Uh, and then for the, for the lifetime of the vehicle in the subsequent uh, operating stage, uh, the partners we have selected commonly follow us into the support stage uh, and contribute in maintenance, uh, upgrades, spares, services of various kinds. All in all, we, we, we trust that uh, the setup is contributing to national sovereignty and uh, security of supply. For sure, we have seen uh, that it also enables the, the, the partners to, to expand on further export business and other, other possible programs. Uh, next, please. So if we look at the, the capability of a CV90 in this case, and as I said, our continuous interest to further develop it for future needs. We can see the blue hexagon in the middle that is representing the current capability of the vehicle. Should we decide to solely develop it to take the next steps you can see the, the red hexagon being somewhat enlarged. And uh, for those observants, you can note that we, we are pretty confident in our ability to, to uh, grow the capability in terms of mobility and protection. But uh, next slide, please. When we add uh, the competence from academia, other industry, 
we listen to the the customers we can further we can see that the cap capability growth will increase f even further in, into the other areas so hence th this is the reason why we are keen and eager on conducting industrial cooperation it makes us better it makes our products better and it makes uh, our customers happier next please uh, this illustration shows how we work to bridge the gap between academia and vehicle design we do this by working strategically with technology development typically at the trl four to six uh, and we are working together with you universities to harvest and push technologies into service next please one plus one equals to three what do we mean by that well when we work together academia helps us with novel research and we will help them to productify and to make products come alive and at the end we will help our soldiers due to our cooperation academics often need to work with industry partners to support their research and such partnerships we have seen can often deliver truly groundbreaking results uh, on the right side you see a number of universities which we've had uh, cooperation with in, in recent years. Next, please. Collaboration between industry and academia is key to catalyze innovation and growth in technology. And here you can see some of the areas where we foresee further cooperation in future. Autonomy, cybersecurity, sensor fusion, AI, etc. Next, please. Uh, the most recent cooperation we can show you is with uh, the Technical University in Prague, CTU, uh, who carried out a cyber threat study on military vehicles on our request. Uh, next, please. And to sum it up, we be truly believe that our close cooperation with academia, with users, with suppliers, research institute, uh, it co contributes to sustainable jobs, keeping capabilities at the cutting edge, ours and yours. And we bring system knowledge into the country where the vehicles are supposed to work. And with that, we contribute to national sovereignty and security of supply. Next, please. I will finish it off with some uh, objective quotes <laughs> from our uh, some of our customers and partners. And at the same time, I will would like to thank you very much for your attention. Muito obrigado. Thank you. Next, please. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, thanks to keep the pace with, with time. And uh, now we are going further to our second uh, panelists. Please, Mr. Mark Café. Great. Thank you very much. So um, my colleague Ulf talk, talked about one of the members of our BAE systems family, and I will talk now about the big B systems and how we approach uh, new markets in general, because this is a general guidance of our company, uh, no matter the uh, company, uh, we are talking about. We, we are kind of federation of companies uh, under BA Systems Flex. Um, next, please. So BA Systems is a big company 
uh, established worldwide. We have nowadays uh, about 87,000 people, almost 88,000 people around the world. That will be object of uh, another slide to better understand. Distributed in 40 countries around the world. One of those, of course, is Sweden. We normally uh, are engaged to help our customers to stay uh, steps ahead when protecting their sovereignties, their people, their national security, uh, and critical infrastructure uh, in general. We also like to work very close with local partners, as said by Ulf, supporting the economic growth and development through the transfer, transfer of technology and knowledge, basic skills and some others. Um, next, please. This is the facts about our company. So as I said, it's a global defense company uh, established worldwide. Uh, we are acting all the domains, so air, uh, sea, the land, and I could say also cyber. Principal markets that internally we call home markets is United States, uh, United Kingdom, Saudi Arabia, and Australia. We have customers in about 80 countries, including Brazil, in all three domains. Our results in 2020 was about 21 billion pounds. We are traditionally investing in education. So uh, we have a data uh, from 2018 that we have invested about 90 million pounds in education. So this number probably includes what was commented by my colleague in Sweden. We have also invested about 11, 11 billion pounds of, with 22,000 contracted suppliers in the world. This is a very interesting point to remember in the further moments uh, in this, in this uh, presentation. Next, please. So this is a map that I've mentioned. So this gives you the dimension and the complexity of this company. So it's uh, the size of you know, sometimes bigger than many armed forces around the world. And we manage people all around the world under the same policy, the same flag. And of course, they are independent companies to take their decisions and sometimes to develop uh, the, the business. So BA Systems, we are a original company uh, from the air sector, a kind of Embraer in uh, UK. So this is history is kept in our uh, name. So BA Systems uh, reminds our original configuration, British Aerospace Engineering. And after 98, we became a big company with the merging of several other sectors progressively. But still, uh, we have the air sector dominating our, uh, our uh, incomes by 52%, the maritime sector about 25, land 18%, and the new sector incorporated, I can say new because when we talk about highlands, for example, we are talking about a 60 years, 60 six year old company. We have our colleagues from Bofors, they are still more old producing defense equipment. And cyber is a new domain uh, of the, uh, the uh, defense. But talking about air, we are part of the Typhoon. We produce the Typhoon, which is a combat aircraft in the domain of the uh, Aerofighter Consortium. We also are part of the F-35, uh, where we produce sub-assemblies and systems for this consortium, led by United States. Uh, it's not mentioned here, but we, uh, we go to about 30, 35% of the 
aircraft. We design, manufacture, and support electronics equipment for military aircraft also. And we are also um, part of the MBDA, which is a company dedicated to missiles. So we represent about 37% of that company. We also manufacture a Hawk trainer, which is a fast jet to support the uh, initial training for fighter pilots. In Brazil, we have uh, a different profile for the education of the fighter pilots, but the, major, uh, the majority of the countries, they, they use this type of configuration, having a fast jet training. We are also working to develop the next generation unmanned air systems and defense information systems. This is another very important point that links us to the fact that we, we deliver the state of the art and made the, the steps ahead. In the maritime domain, we produce starting with submarines. This is very focused on UK. Um, we design all, very all complex uh, types of warships, including in Brazil, uh, we have the uh, Niteroi class, which is one of our designs. So they will be, uh, they will be replaced by the Tamandaray frigate, but they are still in service. We provide also uh, support service for the UK and we design and manufacture naval guns, torpedoes, radars, etc. In the land sector, uh, to which uh, Highlands is one of the, the members of the family, we design, manufacture, upgrade several different types of vehicles for US, UK, and Brazil is one of our customers. So we have vehicles from BAE systems in the Army. Uh, and also in the, the Marine Corps. We also design hybrid electric systems and we design artillery systems in uh, all sorts of launchers. And cyber, as I said, is the brand new uh, uh, member of the family. Uh, we basically supply cyber defense, cyber intelligence and security to US government in particular, and we have also the branch in UK that can supply uh, uh, commercial systems and also uh, government systems. Okay, going to uh, the case of studies, uh, we would like to present, and this will be the main problem, main focus on how we can impact local markets. We had this uh, case in Thailand where we Produce, we cooperated in the production of two uh, ocean patrol vessels in 2011, starting in 2011. This, those ships, based on BAE systems design, were built by Bangkok Dock, which is an arsenal owned, owned by the Royal Thai Navy. So it's a governmental uh, infrastructure. Initially, engineers from BAE systems offered the design and work it together for the construction of the vessel to transfer design knowledge, technology, and, and basic skills. Uh, the second vessel was basically built by the local capabilities. So BE system had much less participation in this second vessel because of the necessary transfer of technology, knowledge, and skills. So the long, but we would like to comment that uh, as any of the uh, military or defense procurement, uh, they need, however, a long-term sustainment of the acquired capabilities. Otherwise, it risks to lose <clears throat> this, those capabilities if the, the uh, country takes too long to upgrade or replace. This is a an universal challenge that we we could including discuss the case for Brazil. The second case I would like to present with you is not related to uh, a governmental infrastructure, but a partnership with a private company happened in Turkey called FNSS, 
is the name of the joint venture of these systems with the local company called Neuro. As I said, uh, FNSS is a joint venture where B Systems is the minor, uh, minor shareholder and Neuro Holding, which, who detains the 51%, is a Turkish private held, held industrial group. Uh, this partnership was established in the late uh, 80s uh, for a supply of wheeled vehicles to a specific program of the Turkish Armed Forces. Uh, and B Systems was acting in partnership with Neuro to upgrade uh, a very specific program of the Turkish Armed Forces. Making a link with the, uh, the last comment, of course, we are talking about a private company, but a private company doesn't sell uh, this type of products to, you know, in the commercial, commercial market. So we still need a great participation of pro governmental products. Uh, during the time, um, FNSS, the current uh, joint venture, gained more niches of capability. Today, they have their own designs. They design their own vehicle, both wheels and tracks. They have tanks, troop carriers, engineering specialists, and they are able to design uh, their own portfolio improving tourists. Although we are, we are, we continue to support uh, uh, FNSS as, as, as a partner, as a shareholder. They evolved, FNSS evolved into a very capable developer and manufacturer and is now one of the Turkish national champions in the defense industry. I would say sometimes they are our competitor against VA systems because different from Hagnas, who, who is a family VA systems, they are independent. We just uh, are a minor shareholder. Um, this the company has a revenue around 500 million dollars in, in in 2019 and uh the main market is in the middle east and southeast of asia um uh, i could say arriving in brazil so in summary b systems uh, welcomes and encourages research that looks into impact of defense programs in the local industrial and technology technological development respecting of course the applicable confidentiality clauses we are prepared and to support uh, case study research from the academia that look into international programs where b systems was involved and we believe uh, the, the, those studies can offer valuable lessons to improve public uh, policy defense procurement management in Brazil and help the country to improve taxpayer money expenditure and achieve its technological independence goals. Uh, next, please. So just would like to say thank you. I give you uh, my personal data and also Felipe Medeiros who works for me uh, as a business development. We, are, uh, we will be very happy to respond to your questions after we, we finish the Q&A in the session. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you, Marco. 15 minutes sharp. Wonderful. As a good um, retired colonel and pilot, I skip, I skip, <laughs> I skip my skill. <laughs> yeah, you keep accurate. So uh, we're moving forward, further. Uh, Tamiris Santos, please. Thank you, Professor Zwartman. Thanks, everyone. Um, could I have the presentation, Patricia? <laughs> Uh, it's appearing right in the screen. Everyone's seeing, everyone can hear me. So, uh, loud and clear. Perfect. Uh, first, I'd like to show my gratitude uh, to everyone that is watching us, and particularly to Professor Zwartman for the kind invitation 
to be here. Uh, it's an honor to be here at Enabed after uh, such a time uh, apart from the academia. So I'm really happy. I'm really glad to be here to share some ideas with you. And well, uh, moving forward to the presentation, just a, a little disclaimer. Um, well, uh, I beg your pardon beforehand because my English is really limited. So if I commit any mistakes, so please forgive me. And I'm here to share some ideas with you about uh, interoperability, governance and defense, uh, how it impacts the defense sector. And I think that uh, all our presentations have a bit of connection in here today. So I hope to uh, make uh, this point clear uh, briefly. So next, please. Uh, going to the concept of interoperability is really, really tricky because we have a bunch of different definitions across the literature. And when we move uh, this uh, specific concept to the defense, uh, the challenge becomes bigger. So uh, a more encompassing way to translate this concept to defense is like a, a measure of the degree to which various organizations and individuals are able to operate together to achieve a common goal. So we have and uh, within this concept, uh, the technical and the non-technical part that we uh, will try to explore in the next slide. Next, please. So I think everyone's seeing here, uh, we have, as difficult as it is to define interoperability, as I mentioned before, there are basically two ways to address it and to understand how this concept came to the defense debate. So uh, the first is addressing to the categories of it, the technical and non-technical interoperability. The second is understanding the context in which this concept became a name. So uh, we can see uh, across the literature, the defense literature, that uh, this concept is made present in different defense documents, including military doctrines, and it's addressed as a necessary capability to achieve military effectiveness. So uh, military effectiveness is a very close uh, debate to the development of interoperability and the debate is commonly associated with jointness, joint tree, joint planning, uh, C4, ISR, and the like. And here, I'd like to highlight basically that uh, where this debate is a bit more developed, a bit more cemented uh, within uh, public understanding or uh, defense documents and the, across the defense sector, not only the single services, but the defense sector as a whole, uh, we st have the development of measurement tools. In our case here, I highlighted two of them, uh, the levels of information systems interoperability that uh, emerged well, within the Department of Defense from the United States and is used uh, in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. Basically, it regards systems and the operation impact in systems architecture, but we also have an effort to measure uh, organizational interoperability. Uh, this effort was first made and at the DSTO in Australia, where they try to measure uh, command and control under operational impacts within combined military operations. So next, please. Here we have uh, the two, uh, the division uh, of these two measurement tools. As you can see, uh, interoperability can be understood in layers. Understanding as uh, how this concept is unfolded in layers is a uh, it's primal. It's the first step uh, to understand uh, the complexity of such a concept. So uh, LICI works uh, more in the technical domain, while uh, organizational interoperability maturity model works in the non-technical domain. Uh, but it seems rather simple if I address like that. But let's move to the next slide and you shall see the difficult part of 
the organizational interoperability debate. Next, please. Well, obviously, I will not have the time or the intention to address to all these elements. It's just to illustrate to you that we have a lot of elements encompassed within uh, translating uh, organizational interoperability to the defense sector. So uh, we have a comprehensive board of the instance abridged by organizational interoperability here. And despite uh, what few and Clark, the, the authors of the organizational interoperability maturity model uh, try to focus that was on combined operations, uh, the inputs and outputs in here for generating this kind of interoperability encompass a broader structure across the defense sector. And that's the point. And that's why uh, such a model can be straightforward for us to start to think and start to connect this discussion to the military effectiveness uh, debate. So next, please. Moving forward in the sense uh, to the military effectiveness discussion, uh, apart from the broad debate in this area, uh, that I will, I, it's not my intention to uh, talk or to have a deeper uh, discussion in here. I brought uh, Brooks' scheme uh, as it addressed qualitatively uh, four guiding topics in an attempt to measure qualitatively uh, what is military effectiveness. So uh, if we see here at the uh, at this part of the screen where I squared integration. Integration is the closest concept to interoperability. Also, uh, it's quite straightforward uh, presenting this scheme because uh, Brooks, when addressing the military activities that is in the middle of the board, we can see that all of these activities are performed within the organizational realm. Also worth considering that uh, the independent variables uh, at the first part of the table, uh, they address an environmental context for the development of interoperability. So adding all these instances and connecting the debate so far, we can understand that interoperability unfolds in technical and non-technical aspects. Sometimes, uh, as we can see, the, the efforts that we have in here in Brazil currently performed by the single services, we see uh, a greater effort within the technical aspect uh, by workshops and debates, discussions, and a series of uh, activities performed and advances uh, regarding simulation systems, for instance. But we ha also have the non-technical aspects. And uh, it's a desired outcome as much as a necessity when we talk about interoperability to achieve military effectiveness. There is a whole set of variables that could affect how it is developed. But the gap in, the, in this debate inhabits in addressing interoperability in a connected way where we connect non-technical and technical aspects of this phenomenon. And it means creating a governance for this in the sector. Next slide, please. So uh, that's, the, uh, that's how we start the connecting interoperability with governance. With, uh, if we understand governance as a definition of rules, process, procedures that guide strategic decisions, as well as roles, relationships, responsibilities, organizations involved, and at last, uh, the objective evaluation metrics or performance, we can understand that the governance process is a precondition to achieve interoperability. Uh, that's a concept, uh, that's an understanding that uh, we have in the uh, enterprise and business management literature, but can be very straightforward when we try to translate interoperability to the defense sector. So if we define a governance within the defense sector, we'll 
basically provide a clear guideline and clearer basis to define what, when, where, who, why, how, and how much of interoperability is required to achieve effectiveness. And that's uh, basically our gap. When we, uh, we have uh, the address by the literature within uh, enterprise organizations and business management, a government's architecture that connects the technical aspects of interoperability to the organization aspects. We don't have this within the defense sector. And that's uh, a task yet to be fulfilled. Well, uh, should go into the next slide, please. So, uh, what are the implications for defense acquisition programs or defense acquisition uh, in general if we have uh, this gap and if we have the necessity to establish governance? Well, if we establish a greater convergence between governance within the defense sector and interoperability, uh, we can provide clear criteria for defense procurement, for instance, particularly regarding which projects should be prioritized. Uh, one of the, our main challenges within defense management here in Brazil is uh, establishing uh, which projects should be prioritized, which projects are strategic, we lack clarity to establish these processes and we lack uh, structure to establish this uh, apart from the single services, apart from their own preferences. So it's a complicated gap that should be addressed uh, when we are thinking about uh, the general impacts of establishing uh, these clear processes of acquisition accountability and focus uh, regarding where defense budget goes and how we can get the best of it. Also, uh, yeah, this convergence could provide ground to the adoption of planning and management methodologies, such as the capability-based planning that is still uh, underway, facing a lot of challenges regarding uh, moving on well, with preferences apart from the single services, for instance. Uh, moreover, uh, it could provide also more accuracy to the processes, greater room to forecast defense acquisition cycles, for instance, and establishing them. And consequently, uh, it could affect uh, and result in a more stable environment for the defense industry and its national operations, for instance. So uh, these are major uh, and initial insights that could come from this uh, positive convergence of uh, structures and processes. And obviously it would require uh, more studies and moving on with uh, more research. So next slide, please. Here. Uh, I propose uh, basically some steps for our research agenda within this area. And the first step basically would be to understand the complexity of the concept of interoperability. Change in the way it is understood as our comprehension uh, apart from the doctrine documents and also our understanding of this process is really narrow. So we should broaden our view for it. Uh, the second is aggregating governance to a greater extent. So understanding how governance affects different instances within the defense sector, connecting uh, the, the effects and the results across different instances, apart from the military, apart from our bureaucracy and how the decisions made in political strategic level affects operational and affects uh, tactical level, for instance. Uh, another point I add is that we should address interoperability not only as an objective, but also as a sustainability factor as addressed by the literature. And finally, uh, developing alternative approaches to encompass dynamic changing environments to face uh, 
brave uh, to face cre uh, with more creativity and to face uh, our challenges within the defense sector in the debate, uh, thinking out of the box. So uh, next slide, please. Many thanks for your attention, for your time. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, Amiris. 15 minutes sharp too. Congratulations. And uh, uh, finally, we're moving to the last uh, presentation of this panel. Uh, please, Professor uh, Peterson Silva. Thank you. I will check my presentation, please. Can you all see this? It's OK. Okay, Peterson. Thank you. So uh, it's very hard to speak after Tamiris, but fortunately, I'm prepared uh, to elude you all with a very pretty colorful slide. So um, um, the purpose of uh, the purpose of this presentation is to just a minute is to share some trends in security and defense industrial policies so um, very few ideas about uh, security and defense industrial policy uh, as um, i must uh, reinforce that all the opinions expressed here are solely my own and do not necessarily reflect any official position of any agency of the Brazilian government. And uh, thank you again for the opportunity to address uh, uh, the audience at Enabed 2021. Uh, here, the objective is very simple, OK? Is to discuss some of the main trends concerning security and defense industrial policies. And more specifically, I choose four four trends that I want to share with you today. The first one is the technological developments from the commercial sector. And linked with this first one is the civil military, civil military fusion. Like the doctrine or the strategy uh, issues um, that especially China is uh, investing uh, during the last a uh, few years. The third one is the, the importance of centralized defense acquisition organizations. And finally, uh, the importance of national security procurements, not only defense procurement. So that's all the four trends that I want to share with you all today. Um, first, a, a, a very, very brief background um we assume that all the discussion is in the in the background of the fourth industrial revolution so we are here at enabed and uh we must not uh, lose the, the 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 very ambitious transformations that we are we have seen during the last years with the proliferation of drones the discussions about Internet of Things, the artificial intelligence um, repercussions, quantum technologies, lasers, robotics, and so on. This is the, the very broad context that we are we must to, to, to address. This is one of the faces of this fort. Uh, industrial revolution. This is a photo of one of the new Tesla factories, okay? And uh, as I, I, I used to joke with my, uh, my, my students, I challenge you to identify humans in this photo. Uh, my record is to find three persons, and I very, I'm not very sure that uh, we can find the three here, but it's a challenge for you. This is a very 
very innovative factory in this this of course is not uh, representative of all the factories all the industries in the forgery industrial revolution helm but uh, here i want to only to illustrate this again is one of the face of this fort industrial revolution that we are uh, uh how can i say we are challenged to to address in the coming years so the first trend that i want to I want to underline is the technological development from the commercial sector so again from the commercial sector this is a uh, uh, extract of the pwc consultant firm okay and uh, i highlight in red this very specific sentence uh, for many years defense technology spawned commercial applications so we know the rad uh, the, the rather the transistor, the microwave equipment, the internet, uh, the um, uh, aeronautics engineer, uh, we know all that. Today, today, the flow of disruptive new ideas moves in the opposite directions. And what is this opposite directions? This is an extract of the national defense strategy of the United States, okay? In, in the, um, the last one of the Trump era, okay? Era, okay? Um, new commercial technology will change society and ultimately the character of war. The fact that many technological developments will come from the commercial sector means that the state competitors and no state actors will also have access to them like daesh for example a fact that risks eroding the conventional overmatch to which our nation has grown accustomed maintain the department's technological advance this here is department of defense of course we require change to industry culture investment source and protection across the national security innovation base this is a point that i will highlight next in the next slides but uh, uh, we can see here that it's not a defense industrial base the term that the national defense strategy use is national security innovation base and this i will address uh, later link it with this first trend I present you now the second one. And the second is the doctrine or strategy called civil military fusion. Okay. Civil military fusion is a doctrine or strategy that mainly China is invest on in during the last years. Okay. And what is the civil this civil uh, military fusion? basically basically uh, this uh, is responsible for a effort that the, that, that china uh, is making to uh, get closer the, its armed force to the the um, the innovation the accelerated innovation the accelerated transformations that we see in the last years in the commercial sector so let's remind of uh, uh, of companies such as google microsoft facebook okay amazon so bad that uh, companies is the how can i say the the they are the leaders they are the 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 main players of the innovation game now globally. So this effort of China is necessary to, how can I say, involve civilian entities, universities, and uh, uh, laboratories, research facilities near, near to the military and defense apparatus. So that is basically 
in general what what this military seed infusion uh, effort means okay and uh, so and um, one of the big challenges especially for countries such as Brazil is this how can I say the 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 resilience of the paradigm of spin-off okay so we get used we repeat without any data or any further study or research uh, we repeat and repeat again the importance of the spin-off paradigm or uh, that is the investments on military equipment automatically automatically will spin off to the to civil uh, sector that is a wrong very wrong idea first as we saw uh, today it's more common it's more uh, uh, um, we can see with more frequency the spin-on effect the commercial technologies uh, the innovations carried by Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft to spin on, spin in to military sector. But uh, even we, if we consider the spin off or the spin on uh, paradigms, we must uh, have in mind that this spin off or spin on effects is not automatically not natural and this is a very very uh, small extract of uh, uh, a paper from this author called Yoran Efron so 20 from 2020 and um, he said civilian research and development activity is relevant to the defense establishment only as long as channels and support conditions for the transfer of know-how between the sector exists. So again, that is why China is investing heavily on the civil military fusion doctrinal strategy, because China knows that it's not automatically, it's not easy. So then China is investing heavily to force, to uh, put closer civilian entities civ the, the private sector close to the military establishment okay so that's very important we 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 don't understand the importance of commercial technology and the importance of spin on effects on the world today we will fail we will fail to address any very uh, very significant do defense industrial policy during the, the the next years okay the third one the third one the third trend that i would like to share with you is the importance of the centralized defense acquisition organizations and at its screen on the screen you can see uh, some of the examples of centralized defense acquisitions such as the defense equipment and support of the uh, from the uk the traditional DGA from France, the capability acquisition and sustaining group from Australia, the Swedish FMV, the Spanish Direção General de Armamento e Material, the traditional the defense logistic agents from the United States, and finally, this organization from Germany that even in Portuguese I'm able to speak. So believe that is this acronym 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 represent the german defense acquisition agency believe me so that's one one of the uh, diverse examples of defense centralized defense acquisition organization because the defense acquisition helm it's so complex that it's impossible is impossible to realize the defense, uh, the modern acquisi defense acquisitions, uh, based on uh, uh, limited on service branches uh, in, in isolate matter. Okay, 
finally, and I, I finish here my presentation, I want to share and uh, um, how, uh, remember that that expression used by the national the, that we see on the national defense strategy of the United States that is not a defense industrial base. It's not the, the, the core of the discussion today. It's more uh, defense, uh, uh, a national security innovation base, or uh, more important, defense, uh, uh, industry and science and technology innovation at all so we're not in the, the the world today it's useless to discuss what's important the defense industry or the commercial technology and if he defense if is the defense industry that carry out the, the the big chunk of the innovation that is useless the most important is to invest on in science, technological innovation. So national security procurements, when I, I say national security procurements, I'm thinking not only in the defense realm, but also in law enforcement procurements, customs and border security procurements, critical infrastructure protection projects and programs, national coordination centers, because now we, we heard some words like big data and blockchain, so we are, must be ready to tackle this challenge also. And e-government, at, at, uh, obviously, because e-government in a cyber warfare, cyber security and cyber defense uh, um, debate, I think, I think that it's a discussion very, uh, how can I say, important to, to, to invest in, coming, in the coming years, okay? So thank you for your time and attention. And uh, if you have any questions, please, I would be pleased to answer them, okay? Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you, Peterson. We have here four very interesting and thoughtful presentations in our panel. So now we are moving further for the second part where we have we will open the floor for question and answer. So please, uh, if you, anyone on the audience, uh, uh, you might uh, uh, type in the chat or open your mic and make your, your question, please. Repetindo, uh, quem quiser fazer a pergunta em português, tanto no, no, no chat quanto na... Uh, Abrindo o microfone, fique à vontade que nós, nós traduzimos para o, o, o Fanderson. É, professor é, Eduardo, eu tenho uma pergunta é, aos expositores. Pois não. É, meu nome é Suélio. É, sobre a questão da interoperabilidade é, é, nas Forças Armadas, é, há algumas Forças Armadas... É, de alguns países no mundo que, que já estão bastante avançados nesse sentido. Mas, é, se, se nós vermos e observarmos, a grande parte, é, a, grande, a maior parte dos países, ainda as, as forças armadas, no caso, é, exército, marinha e, e aeronáutica, ou em alguns países, é, força aérea, não trabalha de forma com interoperabilidade. O que, que vocês pensam que ainda há essa, essa resistência de romper esse paradigma das forças, né? fazer as compras, fazer as aquisições, elas trabalhar de forma conjunta? Né? Às vezes a gente vê, vê uma força é, desenvolvendo um projeto que é desenvolvido também na outra força, só muda a forma. Então, como que vocês vejam que é, é, de romper esses paradigmas e, e as forças armadas, né, é, em alguns países são três, outros países são quatro, por exemplo, Estados Unidos, como fazer para essas forças armadas trabalhar de forma conjunta e adquirir tudo de forma integrada e haver essa interação é, de forma respeitosa, educada, de forma mútua? Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Suélio. Uh, Mr. Anderson, I'll try to translate the question. Okay, uh, uh, Suelio has uh, uh, pointed out that uh, um, most of the armed forces around the world 
do not are, are not in pace with uh, interoperability. interoperability. So uh, uh, he he asks uh, uh, how uh, uh, procurement process could uh, uh, move forward on these on these fields, since uh, uh, it's very oft, often to to um, uh, to in the, uh, to find cases where uh, different branches has um, uh, competing programs uh, at the same time, acquisition programs at, at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, it was clear for you? Uh, so before, uh, uh, did you understood the, the question? Before you answer the, the, the question uh, properly? Po possibly, yes. Uh, uh, I'll give it a try and, and you may correct me if I misinterpreted. Uh, but uh, of course, when, when there are uh, several programs uh, running in parallel uh, with the somewhat uh, deviating demands, uh, different requirements, uh, it is not always easy to find 100% synergy effects for, for procurement. Uh, we need to balance that. And uh, at the same time, uh, we 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 strive to provide cost efficient solutions to the customers. So of course we have a dialogue w w with our customers to see whether we can uh, adjust some cost driving elements that could possibly be uh, solved in a more oh, cost efficient way by slightly adjusting a customer specific requirement. I'm not sure whether this was <laughs> the uh, uh, question, but <laughs> okay, uh -huh. no, th 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 this is fine. Um, I wonder if uh, uh, Marco, uh, Tamiris, and Peterson would like also to answer the question. Okay, I respond. I think, as he endorsed the theme specific of the presentation, I will respond in Portuguese, mesmo já que a pergunta foi feita em português. É, basicamente, Suélio, a tua pergunta ela acaba envolvendo uh, dois fenômenos, né? A parte de interoperabilidade ela é muito conectada com essa questão da discussão de jointness, jointery né, nas Forças Armadas. Né? Então, no definitivamente, você apontou corretamente que assim, existem diferentes estágios de maturação desse tipo de processo pelas Forças Armadas no mundo. Né? É, não é algo assim é, tão distante de desenvolvimento num, em termos históricos de transformação disso num modelo. Né? Os modelos mais avançados que a gente tem em termos desse tipo de coordenação, é, pelo menos que eu conheço, né? eu não tenho conhecimento da parte asiática, é uma limitação que eu tenho, teria que investigar mais, mas dentro do uh, guarda-chuva OTAN seria o um modelo britânico, o um modelo americano, o uh, um modelo canadense seria o um modelo que está tentando achar o seu caminho, né? visto que houve uma unificação bastante exacerbada né? da, das forças, mas assim... Basicamente, o que, que acontece? É, são muitas facetas dentro desse problema, né? Então, não é só operar em conjunto no campo, né? Então, tem as implicações táticas, tem implicações operacionais na parte de comando e controle, cadeia de comando, mas tem também as implicações de natureza política estratégica, né? Então, assim, é, todas essa, todos esses diferentes níveis né, em que esse fenômeno da interoperabilidade, do joint esse processo, eles acabam dando assim, é, diferentes graus de dificuldade. Né? Então, isso se traduz né, pelo fato da gente não ter uma mentalidade muito voltada a essa solução é, adotada de promover esforços conjuntos e maior interoperabilidade em termos organizacionais das forças e dos nossos departamentos dentro do estudo de defesa, isso acontece, é, acaba gerando aí é, várias questões assim, desse fratricídio mesmo dos projetos. Né? Então, projetos que são sobrepostos, né? a gente não tem mecanismo externo, as forças que arbitrem 
né, esses projetos de uma maneira a identificar o que, que é estratégico e o que, que coaduna com uma política nacional de defesa, uma estratégia de defesa nacional, é, e o que, que é prioritário. Né? Então, a gente tem uma estrutura burocrática deficitária, né? como o professor Peterson bem informou na apresentação dele, é, a gente acaba correndo né, dentro do setor de defesa pela falta de uma governança, né, pela falta de ter é, um modelo conjunto que se expresse para além das forças para o setor de defesa como um todo, é essa questão das burocracias se burocratizarem. Né? Então, a gente tem é, projetos de força assim, dentro de burocracias que se encapsulam dentro de seus próprios interesses, uma dificuldade enorme para estabelecer isso metodologicamente, em termos de planejamento de defesa conjunto, sob a metodologia do PBC, isso o Peterson trabalha muito mais do que eu, de uma forma muito mais extensa precisa, mas é, dentro de, comparando com o mundo, né, o que, que a gente tem? É, eles têm uma mentalidade do que é a interoperabilidade, uma clareza um pouco maior do que esse quer porque justamente tem aqueles parâmetros que eu informei, né, que a governança poderia nos ajudar, né, eles sabem o que, quando, para onde, para quem, quanto custa. Ainda é um esforço, né, mesmo nesses países, essa conexão entre os aspectos técnicos e não técnicos de interoperabilidade, mas existe um maior avanço justamente até porque existem ferramentas para medir isso. Aqui a gente ainda tem que correr um pouquinho, né? E aí basta entender primeiro como é que é a apreensão desse fenômeno, como se processa, por que, que é importante, porque é muito ressaltado que é importante ter, a gente consegue eficiência, mas a gente ainda não tem clareza do que, onde, como, quando, por quê e para quem. Então, acho que seria mais ou menos isso. Professor Eduardo, se eu pudesse complementar aí a professora Tamires... É, nem Oi. tanto baseado na minha experiência uh, depois de ter partido para a reserva e ter iniciado uma carreira na indústria, mas com o que eu vivi lá atrás. Como você comentou, eu fui um dos primeiros pilotos da aviação e, na época, a gente tinha como benchmark a aviação do Exército Francês. Nós achamos que era avançado o suficiente para a gente ousar chegar até onde eles chegavam, mas não tão distante quanto uma aviação do exército americano, por exemplo, que seria algo. Então, nós tivemos uma ligação com a França muito forte naqueles tempos. E eu vivi, na minha carreira, ligações com a França como tenente, depois como capitão antigo, quase querendo sair major, e depois como coronel, como você gentilmente leu aí no meu currículo na Ecole de Guerra. O que eu assisti foi o seguinte. É, primeiro, o link foi com a indústria, é, por razões técnicas, como sou os treinados lá, eu tive uma primeira a, a aproximação com a cultura francesa. A segunda já foi uma, uma missão de convivência com uma unidade de combate do exército francês. Fiquei um ano convivendo como piloto, voando com eles, participando de operações. Esta unidade ela tinha recém-chegado daquela primeira intervenção no Golfo. Isso foi em 91, a intervenção né, tinha recém-terminado. E eles diziam muito isso, nós trabalhamos com as outras forças e em coalizão, porque aí o problema que a professora Tamires é, falou, ele se potencializa, e nós gastamos, deu tudo certo, mas nós gastamos uma energia tremenda para fazer a coisa funcionar. É, então, o primeiro ponto, precisa ter alguma coisa impactante que mude a cabeça das pessoas. Não desejo a guerra, no caso deles foi uma intervenção em coalizão, mas precisa ter alguma coisa impactante, alguma coisa. Aí depois eu vivi ah, como coronel já na Escola de Guerra, onde eu vi esse processo já bastante maduro, onde a gente eu via lá a DGA, que é um órgão autônomo, mais ligado ao Ministério da Defesa, em que ele realmente centraliza e disciplina as pontas. Mesma coisa ocorre no Reino Unido, agora a gente tem muito contato, porque a empresa ela é, é a matriz global é na, no Reino Unido. Então, o segundo ponto é, precisa haver uma maturação dos processos, de forma a entender que o Ministério da Defesa, que já foi estabelecido em 94, ele tem que ter mais músculos para poder coordenar, não no sentido de cercear, as compras das forças, mas de coordenar os esforços que a professora Tamires é, é, comentou. Então, assim, há, é, um, é uma temos que ter um fenômeno que dê esse empurrão 
e temos que dar força a, a um organismo central que, que, obviamente, constituído pelas três forças, mas que tem autonomia para disciplinar as contas. Se a gente olha para nossas forças, e eu vim delas, e aí falo com liberdade, nós temos o mesmo camuflado. Marinha, a Marinha, é, né, do pessoal da, da área naval, tem outro uniforme, mas lá os fuzileiros navais, eles têm um camuflado igualzinho, mas com tons de cinza. O Exército tem o mesmo camuflado igualzinho, mas com tons de verde. E a Força Aérea, onde eu nasci como piloto, tem um camuflado igualzinho, mas com tons de azul. Então, a gente precisa, obviamente, ser muito minimalista, mas a gente precisa colocar um, um camuflado só. Nenhuma das forças vai se diminuir se usar um camuflado totalmente em tons de verde, totalmente em tons de cinza ou totalmente em tons de azul. Essa é a minha visão. Muito obrigado. Obrigado, Marco. Uh, Peterson, uh, there's a question in, in, the, in the chat. It's addressed, I believe, for you. Would you like to answer? And if you want to add uh, anything to the first question, be, please be, be as you wish. A primeira, eu estava me coçando aqui para entrar na primeira questão, e aí eu respondo a segunda, porque senão... Mas para o Eduardo e para a Tamires, o pessoal que está aqui, vocês vão ter que ouvir tudo de novo, pessoal. Eu sinto muito, vocês vão ter que ouvir meu mantra. Né? É... Com relação a essa questão de aquisições, eu vou mais além, no nível mais estratégico. E, de novo, muita seriedade, e não é porque isso é legal, não, mas é uma constatação quase que histórica. O, o cerne da questão de inovação militar, de aquisições de defesa, de jointness, né? o cerne ele é um só. É o descaso, é a omissão da elite política civil que sistematicamente não se interessa por temas de defesa. Então isso é claro como a gente só reage a soluços, a crises. Foi assim que ocorreu a Estratégia Nacional de Defesa 2008. Alguém, todo mundo se lembra muito bem que a Estratégia Nacional de Defesa 2008 ela só surgiu no radar, principalmente porque houve apagão aéreo, houve uma crise em 2006 que chegou perto ali das organizações militares, teve um atrito com os com ministro da Defesa na época, houve um atrito in, anterior, em 2004, com o Viegas, comandante do Exército. Então, só a partir daí, com uma crise, é que o Mangabeira e o Jobim fizeram a Estratégia Nacional de Defesa 2008 e, é, para, é, com, com, vários, com bastante conquistas nos últimos anos, a gente tem essa sequência de documentos, que não é ideal, está longe de ideal, mas isso é, é, tem, que ser, tem que ser notado. A gente só teve a ND, as consequências e os poucos avanços que a gente teve na área de defesa em função de uma crise. Porque, em geral, a elite política civil não se interessa em temas de defesa, a elite política civil não brigou por criar uma carreira civil de defesa no Ministério da Defesa. A gente forma aqui todos os anos, todos os anos a gente forma mestres e doutores na área de segurança e defesa, que vão trabalhar onde? Na universidade. É o professor formando o professor, que forma o professor, e com poucas exceções, como o Felipe, que está na Bay Systems, alguém que vai trabalhar no trabalho privado, mas trabalhar no Ministério da Defesa hoje é um funil quase infinito, infinito de, 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 de obstáculos para que os jovens trabalhem com defesa. Então, de novo, todo o resto, essa questão do camuflado, eu diria até mais, olha só. É, pode falar, tem lá, o pessoal brinca jocosamente, que a gente sabe que não é bem assim, é o GT da meia preta, né? Já, o GT da meia preta, ok. Mas vamos para a parte mais, vamos para a parte mais humana, que a gente tem mais teoricamente em comum, a menos que eu seja um alien, né? Mas vamos pensar o seguinte, eu desconfio, eu desconfio que o corpo de um oficial da FAB, da, não, da Marinha, do Exército e da FAB, ele pode ser, em geral, o mesmo corpo. Mas por que a gente tem três sistemas de saúde, um para o exército, um para a aeronáutica, um para a marinha? Então, assim, não é questão de peculiaridade institucional. É questão de realmente ter alguém que faça um estudo técnico, embasado, para realmente coordenar, para fazer o que os outros países estão fazendo. 
Então aí eu deixo isso aí, que o resto é conversa para uma mesa de bar. Né? Aí a gente tem uma pergunta aqui no chat, do Gilberto, né? É, regarding the growing trend of the spin-off process in advanced countries, how does this process translate to Brazil in an innovation system situated behind the technological frontier? And how and also how to build industrial corporations that integrate commercial and defense applications in countries such as Brazil? É, Gilberto, we don't have the, 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 DARPA, the DARPA agency uh, as the, the United States have. Uh, we don't have the DGA as France has, and we don't have the FMV, but we have Unicamp, we have USP, we have the plenty uh, federal universities with laboratories, with researchers. So it's a question that we move the, the wheels, we must move the wheels of science, technological innovation. Like we, uh, in, in the Brazilian army, as you all now uh, know, there is the CISDIA, the System Defense Industrial Academia, okay? But, uh, with, but to CISDIA move on, we must to allocate resources in a pluriannual manner, in a, a long-term manner, because without money, without resource, we don't have scholarships for, for the PhD students, postdoc students, master degree students, we don't have lab, advanced laboratories, we don't have projects, programs, and the spin-off of the programs and the projects. So we, uh, we don't have all the, how can I say, the, the, the size technological innovation system that the most of the advanced economies has, but, but we have the universities in Brazil, and that will be a, a very good first step to think. But to think in this direction, we must think on uh, in resources, planning, real project and program, and less discourses, less intentions and more projects and programs with connection with real world demands. We don't have space, we don't have room for, oh, we, we will uh, research quantum technologies for 2040. Okay. Good luck, but we have plenty of room for, uh, 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 how can I say, aeronautical innovation projects, um, like to, to associate with the current strategic projects of the armed forces, for example. So I will think on this direction. I hope that I answer your question. Thank you. We, we are already uh, reached the limits of time we have to this panel but uh, uh, I can extend for a few more minutes. So I'd like to ask all the presenters to say a final word, if you, if you wish. And, uh, okay. And, uh, uh, and then we, we close our panel, okay? Uh, uh, if you wish to, to follow the same, the same order of the presentation. So uh, uh, Mr. Anderson, please. Yes, pro Professor Schwartzmann. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you once again for inviting me to this event. It's been truly an honor for me. Interesting to listen to the other speakers as well. Uh, I may have misinterpreted the, the question I, I received earlier. But uh, for us, uh, Brazil is an interesting market for BAE system Haglands. Uh, for us, it's to better understand, to start better learning and understanding the requirements, the, 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 the rules and regulations uh, which are given from the authorities. Of course, we have colleagues who are well, well, uh, well experienced in this. But from from the Swedish entity, we have uh, room for improvement in that uh, segment. And once we do that, uh, it is our task to 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 establish contacts, get acquainted with academia, with industry in 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 Brazil to see where we have a perfect fit uh, 
to see possible requirements from the customer and start adopting, adapting a, 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 a suitable uh, setup that will uh, be beneficial for academia, for us, our products and the customer. So once again, thank you very much for, for having me. Uh, it was an honor. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Um, Marco Kaffee, please. Marco, are you with us? Yes, I am. So I'll oh. mute her again. Uh, I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to be with you and also for Ulf, my colleague from Sweden, because we worked a bit together to coordinate our two presentations. So that was great. I am missing Sweden. So I hope when we finish this pandemic season, I can go back to Sweden and receive Ulf here in Brazil. So as a general message, and I, uh, it was mentioned by me and uh, by others in this panel, defense industry, we don't, we don't work in general. Of course, we have small branches, uh, but uh, we don't work with the commercial market. We sell to governments. Said that we need programs to continue develop technology. That was part of my presentation that was mentioned by my other colleagues in this panel. Without coordinated and big enough programs, the technology will not come up to Brazil. And the defense industry we have here, I can man mention uh, Embraer Defense, can mention Avibras, they will not survive. The only reason that we have Embraer so big as it is, is it's because of the Bandeirante program back in the 60s and 70s. That was the reason. Thank you very much. This is my message. Thank you, Kafim. Um, uh, I saw you raise your hand, Filippi. So, uh, but uh, uh, we'll follow the, uh, the, the order, okay? Tamiris Peterson, and then I, I give you the, the, the floor, okay? So, Tamiris, please. Many thanks, Professor. Uh, again, I just would like to uh, thank you uh, for watching and for the opportunity to be here. Uh, so many thanks again for your kind invitation, Professor Zwartman. And I hope that I made some points clear in here that definitely uh, the interoperability is uh, both a necessity and a trend to be followed not only uh, within the armed forces, but uh, in terms of uh, providing a ground for a more integrated uh, political agenda and executive political agenda in terms of the defense sector as a whole, not only in Brazil, but it's a worldwide trend that maybe we could benefit of. So many thanks again. <laughs> Thank you, Tamiris. Professor Peterson, please. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity. It's a real pleasure. And the word know that I, I, it, for, me, for me, it's a real pleasure to talk about that stuff. And, uh, and I believe in, uh, as a message that I call, I call that as a message. But uh, I think that uh, here in Brazil, we have a very special moment we have uh, in Braer, we have the institute of techno uh, of technological aeronautics ITA. we have uh, unicamp usp and uh, other important universities we have potential to run and run fast to how can i say to follow just follow the main trends in the in the technology uh, technological realm, but if we stop, with only we stop and uh, uh, put our, ourselves in a comfort zones in bureaucratic comfort zones, we will not prevail. We will, we will fail in a magnificent way. So now 
that's a very important, this kind of debate, because without the, the civil political elite involvement and uh, with the hard choices that we must, uh, we must make, this, all, the, all this debate uh, will be useless because we don't, we don't have a defense industry to preserve uh, in the next 10 or 20 years, okay? So thank you again for the opportunity and I am available to, to, to contact if anyone needs it. Thank you, Peterson. Uh, Mr. Felipe Medeiros, please. Thanks, Professor. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, Felipe from BA Systems, as Marco mentioned. I just want to wrap up by reinforcing the message that um, this first sponsorship to, to Anna Badge is not, we, we do not want this to be one off for BA Systems. Uh, we do want to cultivate this relationship with Brazilian academia and Brazilian researchers. So what Marco left his, you know, our contact information uh, towards the end of his slide presentation, but I'll leave mine in the chat as well. So uh, whatever demands uh, you may have, you know, do reach out. You know, if you want to, you know, there's plenty of studies or case studies from, from BE's experience that could potentially be useful to Brazil if you want to undertake those. Uh, if you want to talk about industrial trends, technological trends, a number of things in which a company of our size would be a, a, a part of actually, uh, do reach out. We want to have this link between industry and, and academia in Brazil. So uh, do not hesitate you know, to get in contact uh, with us. You know, we, we have been in the country for decades, but not really in contact with, with scholars and scholarship activity, scholarly activity, but we are now. So, uh, you know, this is really to encourage all of you to, to reach out to us, uh, to, to talk and to cooperate. Thank you, Felipe. I really believe this is the kickoff of, of a, a long partnership. So I'm very happy to, to host this panel and uh, the discussion we had here. And I'd like to say that we are, uh, we'll have other panels, other round tables on the, uh, in a bed, and we have a permanent uh, a group that, that we call Area Temática, thematic uh, area of scholars that uh, work as a cluster within a bed dealing with uh, uh, defense technology acquisition and uh, uh, defense economy. So uh, I believe our colleagues will be in touch with you and we will be in touch uh, uh, for a long time from now. Uh, finally, I, I'd like to thank you all, take it uh, and thank our audience and say goodbye and officially close this, this panel. I'd like also to uh, uh, say thanks to uh, the supporting team, uh, Patric Patricia, who gave us uh, uh, the support. Thank you very much and uh, uh, see you in the, uh, the, the next uh, uh, activities of our conference. Thank you and bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.